What is going on, everybody? Good morning here, at least from Phoenix. I know we got some folks that are watching from elsewhere in the world where it may be a little bit later, but I uh, want to thank you guys for getting here. I'm going to take a little time for folks to come in. I know we're going to try to do these every Thursday. We're going to have uh, myself and maybe some special guests come in and do some lives, but uh, wanted to share some good stuff with you guys this week. Um, this is a presentation that I did at APTA Next. Um, it's a passionate topic. Um, just because it's a frustrating thing I see in the clinic. And that's where a lot of my um, presentations and, and work into teaching and different things is, is kind of spurred from as far as the frustrations we see every day in the clinic. Um, before we get started, uh, I just want to see who I got with me today. Let me see if I can get, just bear with me a second here. I just want to make sure um, I have everybody here. If you're here, just let me know you're here. Um, for the folks that are here live, if you don't mind putting a little hashtag live, that way I know who's watching live. Uh, for those of you who are watching on the replay, if you don't mind putting hashtag replay, just want to know who's watching live, who's watching replay, so I can kind of better um, schedule these and better able to uh, deliver these at times that are convenient for you guys. But uh, also, if you don't mind sharing this around to folks, the, the lovely Facebook algorithm, the more you share it, the more people are going to be able to see it. Um, but also, if you don't mind smacking that uh, like or love button, you can you can smack the angry button, I guess, too, if I offend you. Hopefully, I won't with anything we talk about today. But before I do, um, throw some comments out there. How many of you guys get frustrated seeing folks in the clinic uh, who come in with very minimal findings on film, yet they have this thought of bone on bone? I have Arthur. I have my bones are grinding. Uh, you know, all these uh, different things uh, that are going on uh, with patients that can get frustrating. Hold on one second here. Uh, just want to make sure I'm not. Thank you guys for per, uh, participating. Uh, Machiavelli, good to see you here. I can't see the names for some reason on this Ecamm Live, so sorry if I don't call your name out. But it sounds like there's some folks that see that. I know regularly in my practice, I have patients that come in and you know are, are pretty much defeated almost before they get to my clinic just because they feel like uh, they have this uh, diagnosis of arthritis and there's such a culture around arthritis as far as beliefs the internet all these things that we're going to talk about today but I wanted to spend some time today just talking about the modern science around arthritis because I think it's uh, poorly understood by patients but even by clinicians and by our primary care colleagues but also us as physios chiropractors elsewhere I think we don't necessarily always put the best message out there around arthritis so let's let's dive in um, and then if you guys have any questions, I can at least read your questions. I don't, won't be able to see your name. But if you have any questions that pop up along the way through, I'm going to be asking you guys some questions. But feel free to, to pipe in and I'll, I'll stop and, and we'll discuss them as we go along. Let me just get my presentation up here. So again, oops, this might be, this is, that might be a little big. Okay, hold on one second there. All right, so arthritis of course how it's a very common thing I, and I think underestimated how common it is just because uh, you know we have a population of 80% of people over 55 years old have arthritis I the thing I always joke with patients is calling it degenerative joint disease is like calling my scalp degenerative scalp disease and I, I stole that from Kieran O'Sullivan I think I heard him on a YouTube uh, presentation that I watched him do um, but it's a very common thing. It's part of kind of being a human being and growing and aging. Now, of course, there can be more severe cases. We're talking osteoarthritis here too, so any folks who are dealing with rheumatoid issues and different things or other systemic or autoimmune type uh, arthritic changes, that's a different animal. Uh, so with cartilage not really having a neural supply or a vascular supply, and that's always the thing that we think about or people have conceptions of, I'm losing my cartilage and my cartilage is damaged. Yet we know that cartilage can't send any noxious input to the nervous system to register any pain. It kind of makes sense. We, we kind of beat up our cartilage throughout life, compress it, load it, shear it. Uh, we wouldn't want it to be complaining too much because it would probably give us uh, you know, pretty much hypersensitivity throughout all our joint structures. But the thought is what other nociceptive contributors out there, periarticular structures, subchondral bone, increased interosseous pressure, synovial inflammation, injuries to the bone marrow. Um, but uh, Luch Gerbis, I don't know if I butchered the name and I apologize if I do, are there other sources of pain? And I think we see those people where the, the imaging doesn't look too bad, yet, man, uh, they are complaining of severe pain. And I, of course, we have, I have no doubt that folks are in the pain they describe. It's just maybe there's more to it than what uh, some of these tissue-based uh, 
descriptors or, or, or things that we attribute it to. But we have to recognize too, because I think sometimes, especially with this exciting new information around pain, that we do tend to jump to the psychosocial realm and, and forget that the bio does have importance. So Torres et al. showed that there was a definitive uh, correlation of bone attrition, bone marrow lesions, meniscal tears, grade two or three, synovitis or joint effusion. So again, things that uh, you can pick on MRI or x-ray and see that you know might have some association with it. It's kind of like degenerative disc disease where we see some studies that a preponderance of these findings can be more in predictive of pain and have a greater association of somebody having pain as well. Um, and then the kellgren lawrence scale tends to have, when you start getting into it's a grade from zero to four, when you start getting into the threes and, threes and fours, there is tends to be with Duncan and Yogi, showed that it tends to have more of a correlation with pain than, than not. Let me just get this, oops. So, the other thing though we have to recognize, like we've talked about some of the patients we see in clinic, is that the radiology does not tell the stories. Uh, we also have studies that show little relationship between the amount of tissue damage and pain intensity. The same studies that we talked about with Niyogi, but we also had Davis and Hannah at all that uh, showed that, man, there were some people who had significant uh, findings on film yet had minimal pain intensity in their own. So it kind of aligns with what we see in the clinic and it's kind of a mixed bag in the literature as far as what you're gonna see. I don't think we can see, say definitively one way or the other. and that's pretty much what we see in most things as far as there's not one yes yes or no answer it's kind of a a lot of different factors that cause emergence of pain out of the human being so we have to take into account that the radiology could be part of it but it definitely doesn't tell the whole story with people um and and i have a patient right now who's in his uh 70s actually i think he's in his 80s i know what i think of it has a severely deformed valgus knee uh, grade four on the kelgren lawrence scale came in severe significant knee pain he has comorbidities that don't allow him to go under the uh, anesthesia and different things so we said well let's just see if we can work on you know getting this thing gradually with some range of motion and some graded loading some manual therapy oh my god I used manual therapy um, to kind of modulate the pain experience a little bit and then it, it was able to help him load and, and kind of work into it and right now he's walking at times with a cane uh, before he came in with me with a wheelchair and I'm not by any means tooting my horn uh, too much here, but I just wanted to bring his case up. He's walking with, and he says minimal pain now. And his, we, I know his x-ray didn't change. And he's had a good mindset on board because I've kind of given him the opportunity to, to function well with pain. I've made it okay to have pain on board and still load the knee, that it's okay to have bone on bone changes and still get active. He has a loud, noisy knee, but it does not uh, preclude him from functioning well. I think sometimes our implicit biases and hesitation to load somebody with those type of findings is just as much a barrier as any patient views, and we'll talk about that as we the presentation wears on here. Uh, 30 to 50 percent of patients with severe OA-related joint damage are asymptomatic. Again, uh, and do we see patients in clinic that might have that you know joint damage that become asymptomatic? I think we don't have a culture that really allows that to happen too well because we have doctors. Uh, and physios and chiropractors who paint a very bleak picture to the patient who has that. When their findings are there, how many people, how many guys think we even get a chance to let that person become a severe joint damage that is asymptomatic? Do you even get a chance to have that person come into your clinic? Do you even get a chance to, to, to educate that person on the possibilities and the hope despite what the imaging findings say? I would say we don't get much of a chance at all uh, in a good portion of, of cases. I'm sure there's some exceptions I don't want to, and I'd love to hear any exceptions that you guys have in your neck of the woods because that needs to spread around the world. Um, and then approximately 10% of patients with a diagnosis of NEOA um, have, hold on, let me see here. I have my, oops, dang it. My windows are flying around here. Uh, have a diagnosis of NEOA, have moderate to severe knee pain, but normal x-rays. And what this study showed is that these patients who are getting diagnosed by physicians without x-rays. So the, we had primary care people just saying, you have knee away because maybe they had an age or there's a bias where they got diagnosed with it. Yet when they came in and they were studied under imaging, they had normal x-rays. So I think that diagnosis gets thrown around way too loosely in the general population. I'm sure it's variable around the US and around the country, but that diagnosis is just, I think we assume that there's a certain age group and certain different you know, things that you do that you have knee away. If you're a runner and you're in your 50s, you must have knee away. Although we see studies that the more you run, the more better that cartilage and, and compressive mechanical loading um, we're starting to see has a protective function on some of these cartilage structures in our knee. So then it comes to <coughs> no uh, Keith Smart's work uh, and his colleagues uh, about pain mechanisms. Uh, we also have had uh, Cementi and Sluka had recently done a, a paper that kind of expanded upon these, but we're going to stick with what 
Keith Smart talked about when he talked about nociceptive, neuropathic, nociplastic. So what we're all taught often in school is that everything is nociceptive as far as there's noxious input coming from the tissue that's driving the experience. And of course, that can be true. I think the problem is, is we always assume it to be true. There's a, a kind of an implicit assumption that because there's pain in a the joint, there must be a problem in the joint or that there must be damage in the joint or that that damage is that nociceptive input is insurmountable that let's just put a new knee in there and the patient's you know done and you're gonna hear me bias my discussions today to to neo just because a lot of the research has been done there I'm not we gotta we can't necessarily assume that this translates to other joints but I would uh, you know my clinical intuition and kind of n equals one uh, day-to-day uh, practice with patients do see this apply to shoulders to hips, to other joints of the body as well. Um, there's also some research about neuropathic pain issues that that might be uh, possible that we assume uh, it being nociceptive that there might be some things where there's pain in a neuroanatomically plausible distribution of a nerve. There's nerve sensitivity testing and different things, qualitative reports of, of possible neuro, neurogenic type drivers of the situation. So we need to keep our eyes open to that. But we're going to kind of focus a little bit more on nociplastic pain, which is just that uh, we'll talk a little bit. Nociplastic being that it arises from altered nociception despite no clear evidence of actual or threatened tissue damage causing the activation of peripheral nociceptors or evidence for disease or lesion of the somatosensory system causing the pain. This was a mechanism that was described kind of in the last few years um, when they changed the definition of neuropathic pain to um, they took out the dysfunction of the you know somatosensory system and that left this whole uh, empty void of well we can say injury to the somatosensory system but what about the folks that it's just not functioning well where there's upregulation facilitation um, different things going on that are causing a differing processing in the central nervous system of nociceptive input so hence came the nociplastic pain mechanism descriptor um, there's arguments and there's disagreements I'm not going to get into that about this if this is a great descriptor but the, the big thing here is that there's processing issues outside of the, no, the nociceptive peripheral input that are causing a lot of the pain experience, or I shouldn't say causing, contributing greatly to the pain experience that a person's having. And then what do we see with that? This again comes from Key Smart's work. We see that there's pain disproportionate to injury. So the patients where very minute stimulus may create a significant reaction where somebody says, oh, if I walk to my mailbox and back, I'm going to be in bed uh, for the you know, rest of the day or for two days. I mean, where it's just, man, you're having a pretty significant reaction to these loads um, with a very, something that we wouldn't think would have that type of reaction. Uh, and that kind of goes into, uh, that's more, I guess, the disproportionate egg diseases, pain disproportionate to injury. Oftentimes these folks haven't had an injury. Um, they'll just say, man, my knee one day just woke up and was severely sensitive. Uh, psychosocial symptoms, uh, that should be something we're pretty familiar with, but catastrophization, fear avoidance, different things, uh, you know, maladaptive beliefs and behaviors around their condition. Um, diffuse, diffuse painful palpation, so it doesn't just locate itself, for instance, around the knee where you're palpating a knee and that sensitivity is hanging out there. Man, it's palpating all the way up the thigh, even in other areas of the body where there's a significant sensitivity presence, present with that person. Um, the CNS theory of osteoarthritis, this is an interesting study by Morris I'd recommend you guys check it out. I'll have a reference list. And if any of you guys want a, a PDF handout of this talk, just, put, just give me a little comment handout uh, on this and I'll try to shoot it to you via Messenger and then we can get that to you so you guys can check it out. So the thought with this, and this goes with a lot of our persistent pain issues as far as is there... Uh, you know, more than just what's happening at the joint, the joint, that it is a dysregulation of this homeostatic body system. So dysregulation of our neuroendocrine immune system. And the problem in school and everything, we learn these systems very separately on an island that they kind of, and it's a way we can better learn and understand a system. But the problem is the human body doesn't put these systems on an island. They all integrate and are electrochemically wired together. So when we see some of this changes to a biological set point that regulates this, these kind of systems as they work together, um, it can affect disease progression. So we'll see sympathetic tone increases where you know you're getting autonomic systems starting to kind of get more into that maybe fight or flight uh, way of, uh, of operating. You, we've definitely seen so much literature that ties in a lot of this persistent pain issues with gut microbiome and inflammatory conditions with the gut and the gut kind of contributing with, with nociplastic uh, changes in the nervous system function. These systems all kind of correlate and play with each other. How many of you guys see patients that have osteoarthritic change, but on their uh, comorbidity or their medical history sheet, they also have 
irritable bowel syndrome or those different things. Again, I think we're, we're naming homeostatic system disruption with nice little neat separate labels, but is it one kind of similar dysregulation that's happening then instead of these separate disease conditions? Um, circadian rhythm changes, there's actually inter interesting research talking about cartilage homeostasis that's under circadian clock control where there's kind of some, you know, arousal as the endocrine system starts pumping in chemicals to get our system to arouse when we're awoken. Um, the, the cartilage kind of responds to that and some of our chondrocytes and different things will alter their function as we start seeing some of these circadian rhythm changes. And then metabolic system changes uh, as well when we start kind of correlating some of this with some of the metabolic issues that we see with our patient. There can be dysregulations there, um, obviously our, our diabetic and different things that uh, patients often come to our clinics with. But the other thing that I often see in clinic, and I'm curious what you guys see in clinic, is this chronic pain post joint replacement. And uh, you guys see patients who get their knees replaced and say, man, I'm still having the same pain I had beforehand. Uh, and man, that would be frustrating when you go through that type of surgery. I know I see that. Now, what's our response to that? And, you know, the, the clinician, the egotistical clinician say, well, you should never have had that replacement. Your pain was nociplastic in nature, and you should never have had that. We never question the patient's decision on that. That should be never anything we do. We support their decision and say, yeah, unfortunately, it didn't take away the pain through this, but we got some other great stuff we can do to start helping your sensitivity to your system. You know, it definitely, the joint looks beautiful. All these things look replaced, and man, look how good that x-ray looks. Your, your physician's tickled, but you're still having some significant pain after. Let's work on that. There's some great things we can do uh, in physio or whatever system or uh, Mod of, mode of care we're delivering to help you still function better and live well with this thing. I've had numerous patients where um, maybe in the past I may have kind of paint painted obliquely, oh, you probably shouldn't have did that. To, yeah, that's that's okay, let's move. We got a lot of great things we can do and it's, it's interesting, a lot of patients still have some great outcomes despite maybe they had a centrally mediated issue uh, treated very peripherally and then you they get the peripheral treatment done and you as the physio start helping them with the the century mediated stuff with better thoughts, beliefs, behaviors around their conditions. I see some folks commenting handout. We'll definitely get that to you guys. Thanks for watching today. Um, so 20% of hip knee replacements, 10% of hip replacements. The big thing is, can we identify who may respond poorly? I think we can. And I, th I would argue that in clinic, I bet we see patients who are like, I don't know if you're going to be the best patient to have a replacement. Um, and we're going to show you uh, Arndt Nielsen and uh, Peterson and all, and Luch Gerbis, uh, again, apologies if I'm butchering this, um, are doing some work here to help maybe give us some clinical indicators of somebody that may not be the best patient to uh, have undergo surgical intervention at this present time in their life and where they're at and how their systems are behaving. Man, would that be nice to be able to communicate that with an orthopedist. Do we think an orthopedist would be interested to say, I can probably help you have better outcomes with your surgery by choosing the right patients to have a surgical intervention on. I think an orthopedist would drool on that, especially with a lot of their, you know, outcomes being, you know, their payments and different things being uh, determined by outcomes and, uh, you know, more outcomes-based payment schemes. I think you're going to have a, a, an ear that will be present from an orthopedist that would be interested in what you have to say. But you see these uh, qualitative studies, like the one by Smith et al. in 2014. The one is replaced, the other one is not yet, but I get as much pain with the one that has been replaced as I get with the one that hasn't been replaced, so there's no point. That was a patient quote from a qualitative study. Um, and I hear those studies, I hear those comments in my practice. You know, not all the day, uh, every time, all day long, but there are definitely regular opportunities where I've seen patients get replacements and not have the best outcomes. So this is, and I apologize, it's a little, little busy slide with some things flying around here, but you know, we kind of focus our energies as PTs and chiro we're going to just focus on the tissues. What does that x-ray look like? What does the joint glide look like? Let me, let me hypothesize on some biomechanics around that joint. Not saying that it's wrong to have some biomechanical thoughts that we can alter and modulate pain with, but, and, and that's all good and fine. We're probably very good at that, but do we know the environment around that patient, their workplace, their support system, their social activities, the different things that uh, you know, go on around their life that can modulate their experience in a positive way. And then do we know, um, you know, sh shout out to Jerry Durham and his uh, patient experience work, uh, you know, words used by clinicians, staff, patients. Um, when, you're, when that person communicate with the front desk, can the front desk person, you know, maybe diffuse some negative thoughts, help the P 
PT understands some of those negative thoughts and, and expectations before they hit that front door in your uh, or the clinic room in your initial evaluation so you can be more armed and prepared. That's exactly what we're going to start teaching you guys when we do our complete patient experience conference uh, here in November, but that's another topic. Um, interaction with staff and other patients, families and friends. Uh, we probably all have patients who, man, my uncle or my aunt or my cousin or my brother or so on, you know, had a horrible experience or had the, an amazing experience with this, or they say you should never do that or you should never do exercise because it's going to, you know, wear out your knee even more or whatever. Um, that can be a barrier for some of us to overcome as well. Personal beliefs and expectations, a huge thing to understand. Why do you think you hurt? I have bone on bone. What do you think that means for you in exercise? What do you think about, uh, do you think it would be safe for you to engage with me in physical therapy with that? Uh, I always ask patients that because I want to know, well, God, I don't think, I don't understand why my doctor's got me coming here. I, I got bone on bone. Why would I go into therapy? Isn't that going to make it worse? And then we, it opens some amazing doors to have some good discussions about how it's safe and how movement's actually very helpful and it can help desensitize the joint and all those different things. Um, therapist variables, appearance, interaction, all those different things. Don't look like a scrub in clinic. Don't look like somebody who uh, isn't going to uh, connect with that human in front of you. You know, I'm not saying you have to dress with a shirt and tie, but you know, know the culture around you that's going to garner a patient who's going to be on your team, who's going to establish therapeutic alliance with you. So know the culture around your clinic that's going to allow a patient to say, hey, this is somebody I can, I believe in, who listens to me, who hears me, and I can move forward with. And then memories from past therapies as far as uh, what kind of things have they had in the past. You know, maybe somebody was doing a very aggressive pain, noxious input uh, treatments where they're uh, doing some, uh, you know, I've had patients who have had bad experiences with various things, including things I've done. So I'm not by any means um, saying that I've been perfect in my career, but, you know, some of the deep, aggressive, you know, uh, treatments that can lead bruising and different things, sometimes that really uh, can affect our ability for them to want to engage with us. So just knowing that can be very important. And then what does that all mean? So with all that stuff on board, that's why you need to do a good patient interview and know the human being in front of you, know the beliefs, all the things that have gone on with them, what's their social life around there, what's all these things that surround them that, can, uh, that they ascribe meaning to this input from their knee. Or, and are they going to facilitate it and make it more kind of upregulate it where that nociplastic dysfunction is going to be even more ramping up the kind of the uh, nociceptive input coming from that joint? Or do you have you done a great job with your neuroscience education, your reassurance, establishing good therapeutic alliance, and now you're, you're really helping the, the central nervous system from a top-down direction inhibit, uh, decrease. You know, we have such good research. Adrian Lowe has done some amazing work in this as far as showing how well the system can calm down if you put it, if you reassure, you give good information, you give the patient some hope. Uh, and, and instead of, again, like Jared Hall, my buddy says, you know, be a hope uh, dealer, not a guru healer. I think that is such powerful stuff. Um, to really think about with our patients. And then uh, recognize that these type of words don't just affect how our joint feels, it affects your immune system, it goes more into a, probably more in an anti-inflammatory balance, more endocrine and more rest, uh, rest, not arousal. We got autonomic system that might tilt its way towards parasympathetic uh, behaviors and get out of that fight or flight or sympathetic driven uh, behaviors. And then behaviors, maybe they'll be willing to load their knee, maybe they'll be willing to do a graded loading program with you Maybe they're willing to engage in strength training and different things that we know will be helpful for them in therapy from research. But none of this stuff matters even a, a little bit if the clinician who's interacting with that human being doesn't have good beliefs on board with themselves. So this was a study by Edgerton and all that was kind of qualitative in nature that looked at more from a primary care, I believe, clinician standpoint of what do clinicians believe about this. And they, oftentimes patients would feel there it was trivialized due to the clinician feel it's inevitable you're going to get arthritis nothing to worry about yet the patient's coming in with with concerns it's affecting their life it's affecting the things that are valuable to them yet they feel trivialized by some a clinician who unfortunately makes them feel like it's not maybe anything to get too concerned about and then clinicians themselves feel underprepared they don't feel like they have the knowledge about recommended practice um, and then personal beliefs of clinicians they don't feel patients are going to listen to what they ask them to do the clinicians themselves have a negative view on the disease, and they don't really feel there's much out there that's going to help it, so just suck it up and deal with it. So with that being often, and you know, of course we have direct access and all these things, but oftentimes we're getting patients who've trucked through this system where these are the beliefs they've encountered. you got to recognize that and recognize you're up against it a little bit when you have a patient who comes to you and says, yeah, I don't know why I'm even here. Doc doesn't think this is going to help. You know, Doc said, well, 
you can try physical therapy and then just go get your knee replacement. I mean, talk about setting us up for failure. And I'm sure you've all probably had a little bit of that where it just does not feel like we're really get, getting the opportunity to allow conservative care to work. So that's on us to educate our, our primary care physicians. We don't need to be complaining about primary care physicians. We need to be helping them because they're freaking buried in an amazingly complex and difficult job. And then patient beliefs, we see these day in and day out in the clinic. Ben Darlow, if you haven't read Ben Darlow's stuff, you need to. His, he's done some of the best qualitative work, at least in relation to our field, when it comes to a lot of these issues. But um, he's done a recent study in 2018 that I recommend you guys check out. But biomechanical explanation of symptoms and expectations of an inevitable decline are what patients feel like. So they feel like they got all these things grinding and knock need and bowed knees and all these horrible things that, of course, they are biomechanical factors. But... Um, again, I see patients regularly that can overcome their biomechanics by some good thoughts on board, some willingness to load, some willingness to engage. That oftentimes takes some work from some educational things. But where do these p patients get these biomechanical explanations of symptoms and expectations of inedible kind? They get them from us. They get them from clinicians. They get them from uh, physicians. I, I, if I will pick on my orthopedic colleagues, they paint such a stinking bleak picture about arthritis in the joint. They... I, I think the opportunity to work conservatively is stolen a lot of times by an interaction with an orthopedist. Now, I, there are some amazing, amazing orthopedists out there that I would send all my friends and family to, but I get frustrated oftentimes with the lack of understanding of pain and how it can be much more than what their x-ray and MRI looks like. And then patients often think the joint replacement is inevitable, a structural model of progressive degeneration which of course results in them avoiding, reducing, and pacing activities. The very things that can help them start tolerating load as far as starting to regain load, keep moving, keep active, they are doing the exact opposite of that. So we have a lot of different things that don't really move patients in a good uh, direction with it. Um, perceptions of crepitus. This is a study by Robertson et al. Shout out to Marcos Lopez who introduced this one to me. I hadn't seen it, but there's a lot when people, these are all patients actually with, that were with uh, patellofemoral uh, issues and they didn't have oops sorry there I just kind of clicked through um, they didn't have arthritic change so these were folks that had crepitus around the patellofemoral joint so not exactly the same population I recognize you know we got to be careful extrapolating this to our OA population but there's the common themes they saw in the study when they asked people who had this crepitus about it there's beliefs there was search for perceived meaning they you know does this mean my knees falling apart there's emotional responses that people were having it would turn their stomach make them feel like you know something was bad happening kind of concern fear and then just symbol symbolizing aging you know there, I've had numerous patients I just had a patient in their mid-20s who was extremely fearful about crepitus and popping around their knee um, didn't really have much pain but was fearful of like oh man does this mean I'm just you know I'm going to be destructed for the rest of my life and you know we just taught them some good you know progressive loading behaviors around the knee and it was two sessions and they did well but I think the big thing was top down I didn't do anything amazing clinically with that patient it was more just reassuring that it's okay to have the popping you're not going to tear your knee up worse if you just are smart with the progressive loading scheme and I talked about how cartilage shows improved function when you load it and uh, that they were very uh, you know kind of flip their beliefs and perceptions around things Information from others, again, these patients were getting different uh, things from professionals and friends and family. Again, that's something that I would ask, what has your physician said about this? What is your, why you, has your family been supportive of this? Does anybody give you advice in regards to this? Uh, I like to know what's on board so I can, again, know what maladaptive beliefs and behaviors are on there. And then there's this, this qualitative report of, I try to avoid this noise. So they alter movement, they avoid the, th the loading. So you can see if they, have, if they alter movement and avoid loading, how are they going to get back to loading and tolerating loading? It's like I tell patients in the analogy of it's like trying to get your skin tolerant to the sun, yet you're living in a cave. It's just not going to correlate well. It's not your, your, what you want and your behaviors aren't aligning. And that's something where you know, I don't go maybe that direct at patients. But I will try to structure conversations where they see that maybe that behavior isn't going to move me towards the goals I want to have in a very structured, maybe motivational interviewing, narrative-based communication way of getting after it. But again, Dr. Google, I'm not going to get into this. We see this every day on the internet. Uh, look at that and you tell me what patient's going to want to engage with you in loading. What patient's going to want to get to, into exercise with you what patient's going to want to oh sure i'll get on your total gym or i'll get on your i'll do some you know trx unloaded squats i'll do some uh maybe spanish squats to decrease loading on my knee no if that's on board you, you got to make sure you know what's on board and if that's the 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 patient's perception of what's going on 
there needs to be some sit down and or during exercise you know this is where your Joe Nays' stuff about cognition targeted exercise know what their thoughts beliefs what do you think about going to do some work on the TRX or we do some light squats do you think that's something that's safe for your knee to do and then see where they're at with that and, and kind of go from there all right and lastly, getting towards the end here, the pain profiling is what Art Nielsen, he's one of the leading research, uh, re researchers looking at this along with some other of his colleagues. Uh, can we look at pain profiling and pain phenotyping of what are some characteristics of patients that might make them more apt to not maybe do well with like a, a total joint replacement? And he looked at pro-nociceptive versus anti-nociceptive uh, profiles. And it's all, there's kind of different middle ranges here, so it's not this big dichotomy, but um, the kind of far ends of it is, you know, the patients with the pro-nociceptive who may be not ideally suited for a possible uh, nociceptive driven, peripherally driven treatment would be your higher pain intensity, your higher pain catastrophization. We could do pain catastrophizing scales to understand that. Lower local and pa distal pain thresholds. So not only do they have decreased pain thresholds with pressure at the area of the joint of in question, but also distally. Again, that's raising questions and, and suspicions of nociplastic mechanisms at play. They have lower temporal summation pain threshold where it doesn't take much before you put a stimulus into the system that ramps up into a uh, escalating uh, nociceptive uh, pain event. Uh, lack of condition pain modulation. When you're putting, and we see these people, when you do manual therapy, maybe you're trying to modulate pain at the joint and you do some manual therapy and instead of it kind of going down, the more you start nudging input in, it's ramping up. So instead of, that tells us that probably the condition pain modulation, at least with the input you're delivering, is not happening. Um, or you might hear them not also say, the more I walk on it, the worse it gets, or the more I bend it and move it, the worse it gets. So you're not seeing that, that kind of pain modulating thing where you're putting inputs into the joint uh, and inputs into that area, or they're putting inputs into that area and uh, sh showing positive pain responses. The anti-nociceptive people are the folks that, um, you know, show those findings, opposite of what we basically said. But can we look at that? Now, some of the researchers look at quantitative sensory testing to make this stuff to figure it out. We don't necessarily have that, but a lot of this stuff we can, uh, you know, do our old, you know, natural algometer of our hands can determine if there's sensitivity present. Of course, that's not very reliable and probably accurate, but can give us some general thoughts on that. Uh, temporal summation, again, you might see, you can test you know, your manual therapy movements and, and see if you're getting a pain modulating response to them. We'll, uh, we talk in depth about that uh, in our coursework and then we'll be talking in depth of that uh, in November um, to kind of understand that with your patient loaded when you're applying manual therapy. But this is just a good thought process to have on board with that. And then finally, loading is medicine. Mechanical loading, FUADOL in 2019 this year showed mechanical loading of cartilage. This was obviously, you know, it was in a kind of a probably a petri dish situation where it wasn't necessarily in the system. But when they took cartilage cells and uh, loaded them mechanically, there was an inhibition of re release of pro-inflammatory mediators. So research tells us loading is probably good or favorable, but what do our patients think? And we have to understand the possible barriers um, and implicit beliefs of ourselves as clinicians that might make us hesitant when somebody comes in with crepitus and, and diagnosis in EOA, um, but also obviously the patient's belief. So check yourself on your own beliefs, but also you know the human in front of you, know their story, know their beliefs, know what the, how they're behaving, and see if you can kind of find that shared narrative with them going forward. So let's see if I can get this back up without screwing this up. All right, let me just drop my... All right, I did, I, I'm learning this software, so apologize if it's not going to smooth, but Hope that was helpful for you guys. If this was helpful for you to talk about, like I said, a comment handout. If you want a handout of this, I'll see if I can shoot you the link to download the handout of this talk. Um, just want to put a little pump to the patient experience conference we have this November coming in uh, Phoenix. Love to see you guys there. This is stuff we're going to be talking about, not just knee OA, chronic low back pain, all these different chronic conditions, uh, acute conditions and everything in between. How do we take that patient inter inter experience from the front desk first contact with Jerry Durham to post-discharge contact through Jerry's work, uh, exercise through Ben Cormack, uh, education communication from Jared Hall, uh, manual therapy application from me. So I'd love to see you guys join us down there. Um, make sure you uh, drop a like in the Modern Pain Care uh, page if you don't mind. Um, and if there's any other topics, we're going to be doing these every Thursday. So I'd love to hear what you guys want to hear about, what you guys want to uh, learn to help, help more your patients and your population. But uh, I'm going to sign off here. So you guys have a good rest of your day. 
and I will be seeing you guys on the uh, boards on the Masterminds group, and we'll see you next week.